thank you all for uh, for being here today. Thank you, Mat Matthias, for coming along, as, as Brian yeah. says, in the middle of a busy campaign. Uh, when I've uh, said to a few people, especially when I was in the in the press gallery last night, so that today I'd be interviewing uh, Matthias Corman, uh, the finance minister, uh, with the author of the infamous 2014 budget, uh, the finance, the coalition finance minister, with the uh, with the European accent, uh, machine-like, relentlessly on me message, and I said I'd be interviewing here today. They said, "Well, good luck with that," <laughs> because uh, he's renowned for being, as I said, relentlessly on message. This is modern politics, where you get you have a few words. It's the message is jobs and growth, and uh, that's what we say. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's what we say relentlessly over and over and over again in the modern campaigning. So hopefully uh, uh, we can have a conversation where you know we get a bit more relaxed, and uh, then by midway through, Matthias will really start to open up, and uh, and we'll get way beyond the the jobs and growth mantra. I think the uh, but as well as. Uh, um, giving you that introduction of for being relentlessly on message, I think we should also celebrate the fact that it is 20 years since uh, a 25-year-old uh, Belgium uh, migrated to Australia. Belgium had only recently learnt, really learnt English, migrated to Australia uh, initially after, well, I think it was a love interest that, uh, that brought him here uh, first and ended up settling in really a, our most rem remote capital city of Perth. 20 years ago, arrived as a, as a young law graduate, uh, started up really from, from nothing in terms of your background uh, in, uh, in Australia, and 20 years later, uh, he's become the finance minister of a coalition government. So I think that's quite an achievement and worth an early round of applause. <laughs> and I think in, the, in an extended introduction as well, Matthias, I think I'd like to say to the, the crowd, to the audience here, that your personal story and the per story of your family, and we were talking with Bri with Brian Schmidt before, and everyone, uh, Brian's got a uh, got a bit of a German background as well, uh, Brian Schmidt, and uh, and Matthias has one as well, and Matthias's family story, in a way, goes to some of the ma key fault lines in all of European history over the past past century. Uh, himself, uh, that he grew up in. Uh, as you, uh, I sh should have checked the spelling of the pronunciation. Rayaren. Rayaren, yeah. Say that again. Rayaren. Uh, small town in east <laughs> <laughs> in eastern Belgium. Uh, now, uh, this is a German-speaking part of eastern Germ of uh, of uh, Belgium. It was one of the regions annexed to Bel Belgium under the the Treaty of Versailles uh, after World War One. And of course, then it became one of the first uh, regions to be retaken by the Nazis and cleansed, so to speak, of Jews then leading up into World War II. And of course, a source of you know, fierce fighting uh, around, around this Eastern Belgian period, uh, area and uh, the area of where known as the, the Battle of the, of the Bulge, for example. A lot of Australian blood was spilled in all these areas. So, so Matthias's family background, a modest family background in an area which had a critical part of of World War One and World War Two is sort of, I think, etched in, in his character today. And I think even more so etched in another one of the great fault lines of 20th century European history was in 1989. Uh, November 1989, he's, uh, Matthias is 19, he's a law student, and of course we're approaching one of the great, great moments, and maybe you can explain that what happened in November, in November 1989. Well, you're doing such a good job, I thought you could <laughs> just keep going. Um, look, in 1989, I was a second-year law student in uh, the, uh, at the university in Namur, and uh, a couple of uh, friends uh, of mine and I, we decided uh, that uh, we should be part of history. I mean, the wall had come down a couple of weeks earlier, so um, you know, in, a, in a European context, uh, the distance from Namur to Berlin was about 600 kilometres, which is an eternity away, but in an Australian context, it's just down the road. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, so we, we uh, went to Berlin December 1989 and I, I guess f for me that was probably uh, the first time that I had a real, um, I guess, political sort of uh, revelation and that is that uh, political values and principles, systems of government actually really matter and have a, a pretty dramatic impact on people's quality of life because you had the ultimate case study there where in a, a small geographical area you had about three million People after the Second World War starting with the same uh, starting conditions, the same challenges, the same opportunities, the same climate, you know, the same background, the same everything. Uh, but on one side, you had uh, a system uh, 
uh, based on uh, freedom and uh, free enterprise, reward for effort, encouraging people to stretch themselves, a social safety net, democracy. And, and on the other side, you had socialism, uh, lowest common denominator, dictatorship. And, uh, you know, I mean, people, w w what was really quite striking is that if you are on a, a bad trajectory over an extended period, it, it is quite unbelievable how dramatic the impact is on the quality of life of individuals, families and communities compared to the beneficial impact of being on a good uh, trajectory over an extended period of time. And, uh, you know, I mean, so for me as a 19-year-old, that, that was sort of, um, th that was when I sort of thought that, well, um, right of centre, uh, free enterprise, freedom, uh, reward for effort-based uh, policies uh, are the way to go if you want to uh, ensure that uh, people have the best possible opportunity to, to get ahead and be successful. So by then, you're uh, from by background coming up in Belgium. <coughs> it's a it's a conserv socially conservative Catholic area, which I think had yeah. a big influence on you. So by then, in your in your uh, late teens, early twenties, the fall of the Ber Berlin really stamps you as being uh, socially conservative, uh, but economically dry. Would be would that be a sort of character uh, terminology? You'd be you'd be that's a fair description. With. Yeah. So, Mat Matthias, you came out to Australia, as I say, in you know, 1994, you're 23, you're coming out. Initially, I think there is a love interest evolved, but, but when, by, by a couple of years later, even, even though that love interest may not have con unfortunately continued, uh, <laughs> that, that, that... Lucky for her. <laughs> that uh, still, uh, you, you, you were so impressed by Perth and Western Australia and Australia that yourself as a young man came out here and just, just really started decided to start a new life. What was it like for you as a, as a, as a man in mid-twenties in such a different environment and why did you do that fundamentally? Well, I mean, when I first came to Australia, I mean, I, I very much thought it was going to be for a limited period. I mean, I was very focused on uh, pursuing a career uh, in Brussels, perhaps at uh, NATO or the European Union uh, headquarters or uh, so, so something of that uh, sort of uh, nature. And I'd spent my whole life uh, learning languages to be as competitive as possible in the European uh, context. And uh, as you say, I came on a holiday to Perth in 1994. And I mean, Perth is just amazing. I mean, you know, whether it's you know, obviously great countryside, the beach, the weather, the people. Uh, and But I mean, at the time, um, you know, it was pretty amazing how quickly somebody like me who came uh, from the other part of the world was able to get uh, opportunities uh, to contribute and I guess the sense I got very quickly is that Australia is a country where um, you know you've got people coming from all corners of the world and if you have the right attitude and if you want to make a contribution and help make our country a better place then there really is no limit to what you can achieve in whatever your chosen field of endeavor and um, I mean, you know, initially my sense was, well, let's see how it uh, goes for a while and then one thing leads to another and the rest, as they say, is history. And, and so you, you made an effort, you're a law, obviously you're a law graduate, but you made a real effort then to get into politics okay. and to get in through the Liberal Party and you had a goal, okay. yes, I'm no. going to end up as Finance Minister of Australia and no. how did all this happen? It's, that's, <laughs> not, that's not quite how yeah. it happened. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was that easy. Um, no, I mean, it, it was essentially out of weakness to uh, pursue opportunity. So when I came to Australia with a Belgium law degree, uh, that law degree wasn't uh, immediately recognised and I sort of went to the legal practice board in uh, Perth and I found out what I needed to do in order to be able to practise law in Perth. And uh, having spent six years at university in Belgium and the UK for a year, um, they told me I had to go back for another year and a half and at the time that didn't seem like a good idea and the, believe it or not, but the most immediately transferable skill I had coming to Australia was having worked for uh, politicians as a student in Belgium uh, was to uh, do some work for uh, politicians in Australia because there's no, um, you know, there's no uh, qualification that you particularly <laughs> have to have <laughs> for that sort of job. <laughs> I hesitated saying what I was saying there. But um, <laughs> look, um, you know, having, having worked for politicians in Belgium, um, I, I sort of essentially started door knocking uh, selected politicians uh, in, in Australia to see whether one of them would give me some uh, volunteer work. And there's a guy called Chris Ellison who was a recently uh, elected backbench senator at the time um, who was the chair of the treaties committee. And I had spent a bit of time in uh, the United Kingdom uh, studying public international law and so that was my pitch, that was my angle, I can do some work for you and um, through, through him um, I sort of got involved in the Liberal Party and again I mean sort of one thing leads to another and again the rest is history. 
Thanks, and I will say that I will open it up to questions after we have a little chat here, so please think of some questions and I'll t turn to you in a little while. Uh, fast forward, uh, uh, you've built a career, you've obviously done very well in terms of technical expertise and of being of use to uh, a political party and no doubt playing uh, the political power game, if you like, because with the election of the Abbott government, uh, you become the finance minister uh, over some other fancy candidates such as Arthur Sinodinas, who we had he here last night. So that was, that was quite a, an achievement. Now, in 2016, we're obviously a couple of weeks out uh, from an election. We're in an election campaign, uh, election mode, and you are the spokesman, the official campaign spokesman for the, for the Liberal Party. Or for the coalition? Is it is it for the both, or is for, it for, for the coalition? For the coalition, you're the and so you'll base yourself in Canberra, and you're the spokesman. Can you give us give the the room here an, an idea of what does that involve? What does being spokesman for the campaign involve? Well, it involves talking to the Australian people about our plan for jobs and growth. I had yes. to get <laughs> through the intermediary of uh, the Canberra Press Gallery, and uh, to try and obviously make sure that uh, they see uh, the world the way uh, they should see the world, uh, that they are very conscious of the risks of the alternative, which doesn't have a plan for the economy, which doesn't have a plan for jobs and growth, <laughs> which just have a plan for uh, higher taxes and bigger deficits, which and should hurt jobs and growth. And, and so, uh, and I know, um, every day, so you've been doing this, I think, every day since the election was called on, uh, on May the 8th. Uh, so every day you get up at around about... Can I ask a personal question? What time do you... Yeah, I, I, you I sort of get up around about five and yeah. uh, sort of try and get myself into the office, you know, between 5.30 and 6 um, and then on we, off we go. And so there is a... No doubt there is a... As I understand, there is a, a group that is the, sort of runs the campaign and someone's got to run it. Can you lead us through who that group is, the, the key players in that group? Well, you know, I mean, the, the person that runs the campaign is the National Campaign Director, Tony Nutt. <coughs> He's the Federal Director of the Liberal Party. Uh, but, I mean, obviously beyond that, there is, as you would expect, <coughs> a level of coordination involving, you know, the Prime Minister and uh, the uh, leadership team. Uh, so, you know, the Prime Minister uh, is, is in the small group. Uh, and you, what, do you have a meet, phone hook up at, yeah. uh, at say, 6 a.m., 6.30, or how does, Look, how does it all uh, work? I'm, I'm not going to go into the forensic detail of our tactics and processes, but yes. what, I, what I would say is that, obviously, you know, this is a, a, a team game. We've got a... A plan for Australia that we believe is the right plan uh, for our future, and we've got a team that is out there promoting uh, the plan. And uh, you know, you, as you'd expect us to do, as part of a competent um, effort, uh, you know, there's a level of coordination that goes on in order to ensure that we get our message across, and in order to ensure that wherever our competition uh, seeks to mislead people, um, we uh, point that out very clearly. So you have a, you know, some sort of early morning hookup, yeah, and then you decide, presumably, <laughs> you, you decide, you know, what the message of the day is. I know you've got, I know you've got your over, obviously you've got your overall theme. But say, for example, when we've had the the Medi scare that's come out that was bubbling up since late last week. Now uh, you might have between the, the the leadership group and the campaign group, you decide on well, how are we going to counter the the Medi scare? So well, B B Bill Shorten has been trying to get this uh, pretty dishonest and deceptive scare campaign up for months. <laughs> Uh, you know, what it shows, in our view, uh, is that clearly Labor doesn't have a plan for the economy. They haven't got anything else left to talk about. So what uh, they're focused on now is, uh, you know, essentially running what they know is a deceptive and, qu quite frankly, hypocritical scare campaign. Um, uh, there was the case, though, that, that, and it seems to be a totally reasonable thing, that the government had been planning to take all the, the processing of, I think it's about $30 billion dollars worth of uh, Medicare claims each year and to get a, a private provider to do it. That, that seems a totally reasonable thing to be planning You for. shouldn't believe everything you read in the newspaper, even <laughs> if it's the financial <laughs> review. Um, it is not right to say that the government was planning to do that. It's true to say that governments of both political persuasion, uh, in, including uh, the Labor government, uh, when Chris Bowen was the Human Services Minister, explored a series of options on how we can best uh, modernise the Medicare uh, payment system. Uh, no decision was taken at any time uh, to contract out any services and, and certainly no decision was ever taken uh, to privatise Medicare. There is no such thing as a Medicare privatisation uh, task force. So, uh, you know, the sad thing in this campaign is that Bill Shorten uh, not only uh, misled uh, the Australian people, he misled Bob Hawke into believing that there is this thing called a Medicare privatisation task force, uh, which there isn't. Uh, so, I mean, I go back to where I started. Uh, clearly, uh, they haven't got anything to talk about in terms of their plans for jobs and growth. 
so they come up with a scare campaign or two. So, so and I think you've seen there the way, you know, in the political art of things that, you know, in an election campaign, uh, we're sitting here having a discussion, but you have to uh, really bring it back to, there's no, there's no wiggle room, you can't sit here and sort of discuss this, that and the other thing, you've got to come relentlessly back to it. So, well, I'm so answering all your questions. Well, but I'm how do you... Taking uh, the board away, you played my can, way. Can I, how do you sort of steel yourself, and even outside of an election campaign, so, so well to... Uh, avoid answering the question. <laughs> I, I thought that I was giving you the best possible answer to your questions. So. Well, well, let's say... If, if you, as I say at my doorstops in the morning, if you keep asking me the same question, I will keep giving you the same answer. So, so say, for example, uh, the, 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 budget, the budget... You're the finance minister. You've got a government which is sort of a rec near record levels of spending. Must be a little bit uncomfortable for a, for a, uh, a dry coalition a finance minister to be head of a government which has got near record levels of spending as a proportion of GDP. Well, again, I mean, what I would say to you is that the spending is lower than it would have been uh, if we had not changed the policy settings that we inherited. I mean, you know, I talked in the context of Berlin, I talked about the importance of the forward trajectory and what people who ask questions like that always ignore. Uh, is, uh, you know, what the situation would have been if we hadn't changed trajectory. When we uh, came into government, uh, look no further than the National Commission of Audit report that was put out by Tony Shepard and his team. Uh, it showed that within uh, the decade, at the time when we came into government, spending as a share of GDP uh, was on track to go to 26.5% and rising beyond that. Uh, we've been able to stop uh, the increase at 25.8% as a share of GDP, and we're now projected to reduce that down to 25.2% as a share of GDP. So, I mean, you know, our opponents are trying to have it both ways. They're trying to criticise us for having uh, cut too much and they're trying to criticise us for having uh, spent too much. So, I mean, you can't have it both ways. The truth is that the net effect of policy decisions that we've taken since we came into government have improved the budget bottom line. Uh, that, yes, um, there has been a deterioration in the budget bottom line, uh, which has been caused by external factors that would have happened irrespective of who was in government. I mean, the global prices for key commodity exports going, uh, you know, from $120 a ton in, in the case of iron ore, uh, to, you know, down at some point to $39 a ton back, to, you know, in our budget now at $55 a ton. I mean, th that would have happened irrespective of who was in government. The flow-on effect uh, in terms of revenue would have happened irrespective of who was in government. The important thing is to ensure that the things that you control, the policy decisions that you make, uh, you know, improve the situation. Uh, the important thing is that we're now heading in the right direction and that we're making progress. And, and obviously, you know, we, we are looking forward to make more progress uh, in the future. And as you say, we, we, you can't control everything, and everything. It's unrealistic to think you can. And so the budget projections uh, project that you'll get into, you'll limp into uh, a, a balance or surplus 2020-21. Uh, uh, but there must be a chance that that requires continued economic growth and it would be a, a string of 30 years of unbroken economic growth, something, of course, we'd never seen. There must be a sort of a, a, a non-trivial chance that something goes wrong uh, and in China or the growth here and, and knocks, the, knocks the budget off course between now and then. Well, the budget is based on the best available information at this point in time and it was given the tick of approval independently by the Secretaries of uh, Treasury and Finance. So the economic uh, assumptions, the parameters, the forecasts, they're all based on the best available information. And, uh, you know, I mean, obviously, uh, the, uh, the trajectory is there for all to see. We are uh, expecting to reduce the deficit, both in dollar terms but, but, and as a share of GDP year on year to get back Australian to... Australian people, Australian people should be prepared that something could go wrong. You know, it's quite a reasonable possibility something could go wrong and but more more, more serious action would be required down the track. Well, that is why it's so important, uh, dare I say, that we continue to implement our plan for jobs and growth there because we are... <laughs> you know, and, and the thing is, and I'm really pleased that the message is starting to get through with you, but... You know, I mean, there's a very serious point here, right? I mean, Australia is an open trading economy. What, what happens in the rest of the world does matter to us. We don't, a lot of things happen in the world that we don't influence. So, you know, right now we're facing a series of global economic headwinds. We have to deal with slower global economic growth, the external risks, and we've got to make sure that with the things that we control, we're putting ourselves in the most resilient position possible to deal with challenges and headwinds and in the best possible position to take advantage of opportunities coming our way. Because, I mean, you know, the truth also is we're part of the Asia-Pacific. This is a part of the world where most of the global economic growth will be generated for years, if not decades, to come. 
And, and we've got to we've got to really ensure that as a, as a nation and as an economy, we are as competitive as possible, that we're in the best possible position, both in the context of uh, challenges and opportunities. Uh, with, and, uh, we had a big dinner here last night where we had um, Arthur Citadinus and um, uh, Chris Bowen. <laughs> Chris <laughs> Bowen <laughs> up. Uh, uh, on stage, but uh, the Prime Minister, of course, was also on Q&A, and some would have seen the, the end of that. And with the business tax cuts, which is a, a centrepiece of your uh, of your of your program for jobs and growth, the Prime Minister seemed to be sort of backing off the 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 idea that you ever deliver actually the the the, the tax cuts for if you like the big end of town. He said there should be three elections time. You have to elect me another th you know, three times before we'd get it, and that's where you. So is is the and, the, and by doing that is the government because it's facing a bit of a scare campaign and a few things, we're getting down to the end, by suggesting that, well, you know, it's got to, got to get another three elections before you get these big business tax cuts and, the, and, the, and Labor's running a scare campaign, does that run a danger of really increasing the level of uncertainty around that the tax cuts would ever be delivered and therefore reducing the chance that they will deliver some, some benefit early by business having the confidence to say, yes, I can invest in Australia because I know the business tax... Uh, the corporate tax rate's going to fall. Is the government sort of backing away from this a bit? Well, I, I don't accept that interpretation at all. I mean, the statement that the Prime Minister made last night was a statement of the obvious. I mean, he was pointing out that as part of our 10-year enterprise tax plan, we have uh, deliberately prioritised small and medium-sized businesses uh, in, in the first instance. And, of course, if you put forward a plan over a 10-year period, uh, you know, self-evidently, there are going to be three elections during that during that 10-year period because in Australia our parliamentary terms are... Uh, for three years. Now, uh, why are we pursuing a more competitive company tax rate? Because we know, and every, uh, uh, every uh, credible economist uh, will tell you, uh, that a more competitive company tax rate will help boost investment, will help boost productivity, it will help generate stronger growth, and over time will lead uh, to higher real wages. I mean, you know, don't take my word for it. That is what a, 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 a conga line, as Mark Latham would say, of libel luminaries have said in the past. I mean, from Paul Keating to uh, Bill Shorten to uh, Julia Gillard to Chris Bowen, I mean, they've all said it. And I mean, Ken Henry, who was the uh, secretary to the Treasury when Wayne Swan was treasurer, uh, you know, he said it you know, very succinctly. Uh, when he said that the principal beneficiaries of a more competitive, a lower company company tax rate uh, would be the workers. So if, uh, if uh, the coalition is returned uh, on July 2, will you then seek to, when you seek to legislate the tax cuts, company tax rate, will you seek to legislate the whole 10 years in one go? So it's that, that is precisely what we would intend to do. But of course, again, I mean, as the Prime Minister clearly pointed out, you know, if uh, we were, you know, if, if people decided that that was no longer what they wanted, uh, they could throw us out at the next election. We hope they don't. Uh, we hope that they stick with our plan for jobs and growth for a very long time. Mm. Uh, given, uh, just moving just on, uh, before I open up to questions, the, uh, what's going on in Europe with, with your European background? Uh, we've got the, the Brexit vote on, on Thursday. And obviously, the whole Euro project is under massive, massive pressure. And one of the things, the whole themes of this conference is systems under under pressure. And Europe is one of the prime examples. What's your interpretation of of what is what's gone wrong with Europe? Is it that the, you know the exchange rate regime was just it, it was not an, a, a, an optimal exchange rate area, and they're paying the price for that, or they can't get rid of the welfare state, or or what is it? What's wrong with Look, Europe? Look, I mean, my, my focus is on doing everything I can to uh, help put Australia on the strongest possible economic and fiscal foundation for the future. I'm not going to give advice to the Europeans on how they uh, make decisions uh, on how to put Aust Europe on the best possible foundation for the future. I mean, you know, obviously. People in Britain will make a judgment on uh, Thursday. That is a matter for them. It is an issue that potentially could have uh, you know, implications for Australia. It could potentially uh, create a, a level of uh, uncertainty depending on what uh, the outcome is. And as we always have to do, as an open trading economy, we've got to make sure that we deal with whatever comes our way in the best possible way. Do you think the Brexit vote, if it does, if the... If the uh uh, that uh, it is a Brexit vote, that that could have some sort of financial market instability that, w that you'd have to sort of deal with? Uh, uh, you know, over, over, the, over, over a period until the dust settles and then it'll be on, onwards and upwards again. But, like, look, I mean, there's no doubt that it'll, for, for a period until the markets have figured out, uh, you know, what it all means, uh, you know, there, there would be, there would likely to be a level of uncertainty for a while. Okay, well, I'll open up for questions and I might take one from Graham Samuel to begin with. And please just, just give me a little bit of a nod and then I'll let you. 
Thanks, thanks, Dutch. Uh, Minister Graham Samuel. Yeah. Um, and thanks, Dutch, for uh, treating the Minister uh, as appropriate uh, to a very nice, comfortable interview. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if we could just tighten up a little bit. Um, Mediscare, <laughs> Med Mediscare has obviously worked um, in that the government has um, backed off, or the Prime Minister has backed off on any consideration even of the uh, potential issuing of, uh, of outsourcing uh, the payment system for, for Medicare. Um, does that make the Productivity Commission inquiry at present into human services uh, a redundant inquiry, particularly as it flowed on from the Harper Review? Uh, well, look, I don't, again, I mean, I don't agree with that uh, interpretation at all. Uh, the, the coalition uh, never made a decision, as I've said in my answer to uh, Michael, we, we never made a decision to privatise Medicare, we never made a decision uh, to outsource, uh, you know, various uh, aspects of uh, the Medicare uh, payment system. What we uh, have done and what we're continuing, uh, what we're committed to is to modernise uh, the payment system to ensure that the user experience is as user-friendly as possible for patients and, and indeed for doctors. Now, uh, you know, as, as you would expect the government to do, uh, we, um, we assess, you know, various potential uh, options and potentials, potential ways forward and uh, then you make, you make decisions on the best way forward. We do believe that there is a need to modernise, uh, you know, for example, the IT system when it comes to Medicare. We do believe that there is uh, and I mean, Labor has recognised that too, incidentally, uh, but we believe um, that on balance, uh, that is best done when it comes to Medicare uh, in-house, and that's what we'll be doing. But, but hasn't it, uh, Bill Shorten has really tried to put the, the knocker on the whole PC report on the broader oh. human services area, the, which flows out of Harper, and which seems to be the next wave yeah. of micro-reform and lifting our productivity yeah. growth. No, I mean, what, what Bill Shorten did was uh, actually much more devious and dishonourable than that. I mean, he, he was... Uh, trying to play on, he was deliberately trying to play on by creating confusion that somehow the government was going to sell uh, Medicare. There never ever was any proposition of the, of the government selling Medicare ever. Uh, so it was a complete, it was a complete invention. There was never such a thing as a Medicare privatisation task force. Complete invention. And like, the reason he did it is because, I mean, they've got union uh, people ringing, uh, you know, little old ladies around the country, uh, you know, the government, if they get re-elected, they're going to sell Medicare and you're not going to be able to get access uh, to your Medicare payments. I mean, this is, this is a cynical uh, political exercise and, uh, you know, obviously we, we're not going to let uh, Labor get away with that. Okay, so over here and then we'll go there, we'll go there and then we'll go there. Uh, Stephen Bottomley, ANU Law School. Minister, I heard you mention jobs and growth. Um, Good. <laughs> <laughs> one of the... Uh, one of the conversations that we've been having at this forum is about the fundamental way in which uh, work is changing uh, and the very nature of what we understand to be jobs is, is shifting. The impact of uh, technology, uh, significant changes in many different professions and industries, legal profession for example, impact of globalisation. So what we understand uh, from the past to be the idea of jobs is not what the jobs will be in the future. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how that factors into uh, the campaign about jobs and growth. Uh, well, I mean, that is, that is precisely, dare I say, why we need our National Economic Plan for Jobs and Growth. I mean, if, if you look at the six points that are part of it, the first point is uh, to, uh, uh, you know, is, is, is an ambitious innovation agenda to uh, attract additional investment into startups uh, and the like and, and to, to really um, generate a, a new wave of economic development across Australia. We've got uh, our Defence Industry Plan, which is all focused on... Uh, leveraging our uh, very significant investment in uh, defence capability to support local high-end manufacturing, which uh, you know goes to the uh, question you asked. But like you know, our export trade deals. I mean, in the end, it's all about you know Australia. Australia's success uh, is uh, you know, based on selling uh, as much uh, as many uh, Australian products and services overseas. And, but you know, you're not a technological pessimist on on uh, jobs and employment and uh, in, in the labour market. Um, Things always change. They will. They have ch always changed in the past. They will always change in the future. The key is to be as, you know, as the prime minister would say, as agile and as uh, nimble as possible, and, and to be able to, you know, grasp the opportunities that present themselves. But yeah, I mean, there, there is always going to be change, and we've always got to make sure that uh, as an economy, we're in the best possible position to take an ever-growing share of that pie that is available in the world, and uh, we've got to focus on competing in those areas where we can be the best in the world at providing uh, you know, high quality products and services in a, in a competitively priced way. Okay. 
I'm Robert Johansson of uh, Bendigo and Adelaide Bank. So one of the things that's changed um, around the world is the uh, lack of gov <coughs> government's capacity to spend, given the amount of debt that they all have, which has led to central banks un uh, undertaking this wild experiment of uh, reducing interest rates to uh, where they are, which has had the consequence of huge swings in asset values and uh, flows looking forward. That will have its implications, and I think already does have it substantial implications for where people are putting their money and where they're going to be earning money from. That will have its consequences for your forward projections. When do you start having to grapple with those sorts of issues, the sorts of issues of, um, of uh, what we're seeing in Australia in domestic housing pricing, for example, um, as, uh, what tax advantaged assets like domestic housing suddenly becoming uh, out of reach of lots of people. Your government needs to do more than think of it a three-year sort of issue at some stage. Uh, well, I mean, if you're taking, I mean, there's a range of issues there. I mean, taking them in turn, I mean, the best way to improve housing affordability uh, is to increase the supply of housing. I mean, the, the price of anything is a function of supply and demand. If supply uh, is uh, higher than demand, prices uh, will uh, go down. If demand is higher than supply, uh, prices will go up. And over time, uh, the market uh, will you know, get itself uh, into balance. Now, uh, you know, in terms of monetary uh, policy, I mean, you know, we, we would say uh, that our efforts to get our budget back on a uh, credible path back to surplus uh, has actually given the Reserve Bank in uh, Australia more room to make its decisions uh, independently to... Um, you know, in relation to the monetary policy settings. I mean, if you contrast that, and this, is, this was our critique uh, when uh, the, during the Rudd-Gillard Labor government period, um, I mean, <laughs> Australia was quite unique, where our uh, official cash rate in the wake of the global financial crisis went from 7.25% to 3%, and then went back up to 4.75%. Uh, so at the same time as the Rudd government was pumping fiscal stimulus into the economy, which everybody recognises is inefficient, uh, you know, it, it's got all of the flaws that, you know, we've, that's been much talked about at the time, um, the Reserve Bank was putting the foot on the brakes. Um, and, you know, 4.75% uh, official cash rate at a time when we had record terms of trade, the highest, you know, at the, the um, uh, INO price, uh, you know, peaking at $180 a tonne. Uh, was you know clearly having an impact on the value of our exchange rate, which was making uh, you know large parts of uh, the Australian economy less competitive. So, I mean, you know what 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 you can see now with the official cash rate having in Australia having gone down to 1.75 percent, it's actually still you know high by international standards, but much better than the uh, 4.75 percent in the wake of uh, you know an excessive fiscal stimulus pursued by the previous uh, Labor government. Now. Um, look, you know, in Australia, our economy is performing comparatively well. I mean, we're growing at 3.1%, the most recent 12 months uh, uh, period. Uh, that is better than any of the G7 economies. Um, not as good as we would like it to be. We would like it to be better moving forward, but, you know, that's, that's why there is uh, more, more work to be done. But if you look, I mean, we, we are transitioning from what is a historically unprecedented period of record capital investment and construction uh, activity in the resources sector to, um, you know, broader drivers of growth in a more diversified uh, e economy. And, and, you know, various different things have helped us achieve that, that transition. I mean, so there is the floating exchange rate, which was, uh, you know, one of the uh, great achievements of the uh, Hawke and Keating uh, period in government. Uh, that certainly has helped cushion uh, the effect. Uh, of the significant fall in our terms of trade. You've had you know, the, um, the fact that the Reserve Bank sets monetary policy independently. That is an important feature. But beyond that, we would say, when we came into government in 2013, uh, our first job was to take some of that lead out of our saddleback that the previous government had put in, where we would say uh, that was making us less competitive internationally, whether it's the carbon tax or the mining tax, or whether it's our effort to... Um, we pursue a pretty ambitious deregulation agenda or whether it is our efforts uh, to get more competitive access to key markets in our region, like with our uh, export trade deals and the like. But like, so our, our first, um, you know, our first push was very much taking some of the burdens out of the economy and then we've sort of progressively uh, built on that to take that further, you know, through our 
um, enterprise tax plan. We started in last year's budget by an initial um, wave of uh, tax cuts for small business, and we've, we've built on that with our 10-year uh, enterprise tax plan now that, uh, that we are committed to, uh, that we're not walking away from, uh, but uh, that hopefully people will endorse at three elections to come. Okay, well, well, I think we've got time for two more questions. Over here first. Sure, uh, George Williams from the University of New South Wales Law Faculty, and if you'd like to finish your law degree in Australia, I'm sure we can help <laughs> you with that. But uh, uh, my question's actually about a different type of finance, political finance. Uh, I thought in you were going to ask me about Senate voting reforms or something. Well, <laughs> no, I think we've done that one. We're on the same page on that one. But uh, in terms of political finance, which relates to your other ministerial hat as Special Minister of State, uh, as you know, there's a very large number of stories around that cut across all political parties, around disclosure and a number of concerns. In fact, uh, there seem to be more concerns and stories this election than I can remember for any recent federal election. I just wonder, given your responsibilities, do you see the system as working adequately? Do you see any room for tightening the system, such as even regard to small things, that at the moment no disclosure is required until eight months after the current election, so there's no capacity for voters to know now who is donating money? Uh, do you see some room for reform here? <laughs> Uh, well, the first point is obviously the system as it currently exists is the system that applies for this election and it applies equally to everyone and everyone has to comply with the law as it is. After the election, as there always is, there is a, a review which is conducted by the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters as a matter of course in the conduct of the election and I review uh, the matters that you raise as well. My own view is it's very important in a democracy like Australia to properly balance uh, the need for disclosure and uh, the need to uh, facilitate participation, and you know, sometimes, um, s s sometimes, uh, you know, people uh, forget the, the, the bit that uh, involves participation in the democratic process. And you know, I mean, the, d the difference between uh, the Labour Party and the Liberal Party is the Labour Party has got a, a, you know, a, an institutional funding source which uh, helps it uh, substantially to compete in an election. Uh, the Liberal Party doesn't have that uh, same uh, institutional funding source. It's often harder for business uh, to uh, you know, put themselves out there in the court of public opinion as uh, donating uh, to the democratic process uh, and you know, ending up on the receiving end of, quite frankly, you know, various uh, unsavory uh, practices from the union movement. Um, so you know, th th there are different things to, uh, to, balance, to balance here. I mean, I think that the system, uh, the way it currently works, works pretty well. Um, but there will be a review on the other side of the election, as there always is, and let's see what they come up with. Thank you, finally. Well, something completely different again, <coughs> Matthias. I was intrigued to hear that you cut your political teeth working as an advisor to the West Australian Liberal Senator, Chris Ellison. <laughs> I remember Chris Ellison very well <coughs> as during the, uh, the post-Mabo post yeah. uh, debate oh, yeah, uh, in 1993 as being by far the most civilised of my Tory interlocutors <laughs> on that particular bill, genuinely trying to improve it rather than to destroy it outright. Do you think, in retrospect, the coalition root and branch opposition to the Native Title Act was a mistake? Oh, gee. Well, um, obviously we support the system as it uh, currently exists and, uh, you know, it's very hard to uh, revisit, uh, you, know, you know, decisions that were made at the time. I'm sure that the opposition... I mean, we've got Robert Hill here who might be able to uh, offer an opinion here, but uh, I'm, very confident that the I'm very confident that the opposition at the time uh, made uh, the judgments as I uh, felt, uh, the judgments that I felt were in the public interest. I was very deliberate in saying Chris Ellison was the most civilised major. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Robert, you. Robert was the Thank leader you. of the opposition at the time. I'm sure, I'm sure we can continue this debate. Uh, we've, I think we've had a terrific discussion. Uh, can you please join, uh, put your hands together to join me to thanking Sincere <laughs> Cormitt and member Jobs and Growth. <laughs>